You ready? The intro is playing in my head right now. <laughs> hey, Biko. Hey, Ban. I thought you were going to start me off easy. Singing soprano in high school isn't really the sort of thing that gives you credibility. Halfway into a pandemic, I was like, this is a great time to start meeting strangers. I had not done a short film. I had not done anything. I'd recommend the one chapter that captures all my romantic exploits. Kenya knows what to do with people who give you what we know. How do I like to enjoy my single turn? A little bit of water, just a splash. I like it neat. I like preserving the integrity. Oh, whiskey should be taken neat. One ice. <sighs> I am June Gashui. You're watching Singleton Stories with Biko Zulu. I don't know if I discovered that I had an, I, I felt in my spirit that I had a good voice when I was probably six or seven. My parents did not agree with me. It sounded more like noise, apparently. And so in their wisdom, they took me to singing classes. I think my mom was trying to get me to be quiet and to get me out of the house so she could run her errands. And the result of that was um, I, I got singing lessons every Saturday morning. And it's my teacher who actually said, I think you have, there's something, there's some raw material here that we can work with. And so she had a conversation with my mom and my mom was like, you want her to do what? Singing is just a thing that I used to, that she's like occupied and she stops disturbing me. My childhood, I was born in Mombasa. A lot of people don't know this, I'm a coastal girl inside. And then at the age of, I think four, we moved to Nairobi. And after three years, we then relocated to France. Um, my dad got posted to work in Paris. And so he packed up his whole family. None of us can speak French except for him. And we're going to this country in Europe where it's like winter in a few months. We were completely like thrown, but I think that's the resilience that kids have. Um, we absorbed the French language in literally a few months because you have no alternative. Everybody around you is speaking French like uh, it's water, you know, uh, manna from heaven. <laughs> so you have no choice if you want to eat, if you want to get from point A to point B, you have to learn the language. And then it was literal experiences. My mom would send us to buy bread because in France you buy baguette, you don't eat sliced, you know, bread like ours here. So you have to buy the baguette every morning. So I'd walk in with my little few coins and I'd go to the, the, the bakery and I'd tell the guy I need, you know, you start pointing because that's how we, you do. I want this one behind you. And he's like, ah, quoi? Qu'est-ce que tu veux? And I'm like, wow, this is, qu'est-ce que tu? I don't know. I want the baguette. Just give me the baguette. And he says, baguette, baguette. And that's how we started learning the French because he literally would not give us any alternative. Then you buy your bread, you go back, and the next day it's easier. The next day it's easier. So that was one of the first I think memories of, of, of me at the age of probably seven or eight. Um, that was probably one of the most uh, memorable times because we were together, all five of us were together. So we were out of Kenya for about six and a half years. And of course, by the time you come back, I, I'd forgotten how to speak Swahili. I was rapping in French, like literally this was now my first language. English was our second language. And Swahili was a distant memory. But by the time I was 16, I was good. I'd figured out a lot of things and I went to a boarding school, which was foreign. I, I, I Uniforms were foreign. I'm like, what, you want me to wear a uniform? And I went to Green Acres, which doesn't exist anymore. It was a very small school. We wore green skirts, green sweaters, green socks. It was not cute. And then I went to an all boys school after that. I went to St. Mary's, which was wonderful. 1,300 boys, 100 girls. And um, I thought I had found, like, I was in heaven. I was very excited about the possibility of being in this space where there was all this testosterone. And um, I became their head girl. I don't know how that happened, uh, but uh, it was, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. If you are listening, you St. Mary's people, thank you for trusting me with <laughs> your leadership. Um, but yeah, my, honestly, my childhood was, was filled with a lot of joy. So yeah. Happy childhood. Mm. 
Music has been kind to me because it's provided an avenue or an outlet, sort of like my steam stress reliever. It's also put a few coins in my, my bank account once in a while. It's what I used to, you know, uh, buy some shoes once in a while and like, help other people. Okay, I'm trying to like, balance here. I do good things with the money I make from my music. <laughs> but mostly it's been a cathartic experience. It's been a thing, it's been like my, my therapist. When things are going well, when things aren't going so well, when there's heartache, when there's sadness, um, I turn to music almost immediately. I think my experience has been um, the reverse of what most artists experience. I started singing because I didn't have a choice. I would sing at church, at people's weddings, at people's birthdays, family functions. Just June, come here and start singing, entertain them. My dad would tell them, sing this song. And I would be so happy to do it. And I remember the first time I, somebody actually offered us money to sing and I thought, you want to give me, <laughs> you want to pay me to do the thing that I would do out of absolute love? I'm all about it. So. Um, my life as an artist was predominantly a performing artist lifestyle, meaning um, you and a band in front of a stage, in front of an audience, or rather on a stage in front of an audience. Um, and that was probably the first 20 years of my life, I think. Um, and then after 20 years, I thought, why haven't I recorded anything of my own? Why haven't I written my own songs? Why haven't I told my own stories? So in these 20 years, I was doing cover versions, which is basically um, your rendition of other people's music. Um, and that's where sort of the love um, from the fan base started to, to be generated. I would do a lot of um, regular gigs like at places like K1. I used to have a Monday gig at the um, Hilton, not the Hilton, what's it called, Intercontinental. I used to host um, an open mic gig on Thursdays at a place called The Cork, which doesn't exist anymore. I'm probably aging myself here, but it's all good. And so I did that on a regular basis for almost like 10 to 15 years, just regular gigs, um, corporate functions, uh, personal, like private functions. And then I decided to sort of have the experience where I would write music and tell my own stories. And so my album now is probably, it's the window into my <laughs> life experiences, my relationships, my heartaches, my, my love experiences, loss, all of that. Um, and so then that sort of catapulted my career in the sense that you're now as a singer songwriter. You can add this to your CV now. Before that, you're just a singer. Now you're also a songwriter because you've told people part of your your stories. And then I graduated from that um, to producing shows. So identifying talent, uh, young 16, 17 year old musicians who are just epic. And I just remember thinking if I was where they are now, when I was at that age, I don't even think the law would be something that I would be practicing possibly. So it's been kind to me. I think I've been able to develop my own brand, um, speak my own musical language, uh, develop my own genre, which should go into the you know Guinness Book of Records one of these days. Um, it's called Nyami Music. Um, nobody else does this, only me. I think I should say that again just for hmm? nobody else does this, just me. So I've added Nyami Music to the list of genres around the world because it's more about how it makes you feel. There's a, there's a place in the back of your, right about here, where the music hits you. And that's what Nyami music is. A period in my life when I was uh, happiest. Um, I think the, the most, I've had several. I'm, I'm gonna say that I've had several, but the most recent, uh, the most recent one was about four years ago when I um, decided to share my album with the world and uh, work on a, an album launch, which for me, I had visualized. You know, when they say that, that, that you have a visual in your mind about what something needs to look like, everything else didn't matter for me. Um, I had to find the right team. Um, and I think that's one of the times in my life that it restored my faith in like just humanity and people. Like it became our show, our launch. I'd recommend 
the one chapter that captures all my romantic exploits. I think that would be the one. If they only had 10 minutes, they probably wouldn't finish the chapter, but also it would be enough to just make them want to continue reading the book um, and buy it for their family and friends and and give it as gifts over Christmas. Um, so yeah, the, the, the chapter on my romantic exploits. <laughs> Is there a character that stands out? Uh... No, because I think I'm very, I'm, I'm a very simple person. I think when it comes to things like relationships, my main goal is to find somebody who can allow me to be me in all my various facets. <laughs> and if I feel constricted in any sort of way, I feel like I have to act like I'm somebody else. I'm a great actress, but I'm a horrible pretender. So, so I think that the character that you would see probably is just one who's looking to be able to still be her very authentic self and find somebody who's either not intimidated by that or not overwhelmed by it, um, but can give it space to be itself. Um, and hopefully I can do the same thing for them. I have no regrets about any of the relationships I've been in, because I think they've taught me a lot about myself. Good things, bad things, things I didn't even know that I used to do. One of the guys I dated used to tell me there's a way that I fight and I didn't even know this. So I, I don't consider myself confrontational. So silence becomes my weapon. So one day, I don't even know what happened. And this is the, the irony of everything is that the thing is so big and it upsets you so much. And then in like two weeks when you're asked, what was it? I'm like, I have no clue. So after my silent treatment, apparently for like two, three days, he said, okay, Juna, you're going to do this thing. Are you going to do this thing that you're doing? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, you do this thing where you, I ask you if you're okay, you say, everything's fine. I ask you what's wrong, you say nothing. So I'm going to ask you three times. And when I've asked you three times, I'm going to believe you that everything is fine. I said, okay, that's fine. I'm fine. I've, nothing's wrong. Then you continue with your day. Then he says, what's wrong? I said, nothing. He waited like five, 10 minutes, asked me again, what's wrong? I said, nothing. Then the third one uh, happened maybe like an hour later. Then now see my three are done. He's like, so, so we are okay, nothing's happening. So of course I continued with my long face. <laughs> and he said, we had a deal. I said, I was gonna ask you three times. And if you tell me you're fine, you're fine. Then he said, let me explain to you why this is important for you to understand. I'm asking you because it's a thing guys are supposed to do and you chicks like being asked, are you okay? Because it shows that we care. But what I don't appreciate is how much time our relationship is going to lose because of this thing that you're doing. So if you want to talk, if you want to fight, we have the conversation now. Because in about a week, I'll, I'll have enough uh, patience to hold out for about a week, but in a week, I'll be pissed off. And then we're not going to talk for, it'll be two weeks, we're losing two weeks of this relationship. And that was, I think, the first time somebody had actually broken it down for me. Um, then he said, okay, so what song is, I said, I don't know. I actually have no clue. I just remember I was upset with you and it could have been the most insignificant thing. But since then, in every other relationship, I've really tried to, like before it gets there, um, I, I try and find out how to express what it is that I'm feeling. And ironically, I mean, because life, life is short, this, this person I was dating passed away. Um, and I think if anybody, it was, it was important that he was the one who taught me that lesson. Because life is, you're never, you're never guaranteed, you know, a long period of time. So yeah, I think no regrets, because I have, I have so many of those sort of stories where you learn something about yourself in a relationship, whether it lasts for a few weeks, a few months or more, you, it's always a, a lesson that um, you can take home with you. I think if, if you're living an, a, a real life, there'll be several of those moments, if you're being honest. Uh, but I think for me, when my dad passed, that was probably the, the unhappiest um, time in my life. So I had been away, I'd been away for school. And then I came back, I landed like February something um, and immediately went home and I started unpacking and my one of my dad's friends came home. Like, okay, hey, how have you been? How was your trip? So you're gonna have to pack again because we're going. You have to take another trip because your dad is in ICU. I was like, what? I think we had what, maybe eight to nine months or something like that. 
before before he passed. Even that, as as unhappy as that period of time was, I think the the blessing or the gift of being able to have been done with school and be available to. So he was in India for all of that time, um, but going to help take care of him because uh, my mom was there like from day one. She didn't she didn't think about herself for a second. And so we would take turns, my sisters and I, going to help out. But you're sort of always hopeful that he'll recover. You know, he'll get he'll get some more years or whatever it is. And I think that's the one thing we're all we know we're all it's, we're all mortal beings. We're gonna go, but and and I don't think anything ever prepares you, even if somebody's unwell for a long time. So I think for me that was a huge blow. Um, because everything I was coming to start, like my business, I was like, of course you want him to be there to guide you, um, walk you down the aisle, all these things that girls, I'm, I'm not a very girly, girly chick, but like <laughs> with my dad, I, I think I had moments, you know? Um, yeah, so I think that would be most unhappy. Poof, my dad was integrity in a huge bottle, you know? Um, Everything he said he would do, he did. And when he wasn't able to, he'd apologize and he'd say, you know, I messed up and I need to do it again. He would teach us um, like to do the best that we can. You know, my dad was a chemical engineer and me and science, we, we've never been very good friends. Um, and so I think he struggled with that because none of his children took up, you know, um, like followed in his footsteps from that point of view. What we watched him do is pick something that he was passionate about and then grow it into something bigger. And so I think for me, one of the most um, significant lessons was whatever it is you choose to do in life, because again, you're not guaranteed a hundred years, make sure it's something that you're passionate about that has impact um, and that you can truly be somebody who's, who's building. You know, um, people say they love their country, but my dad was a complete lover of this country and what its potential was. So I think that's the biggest lesson for me. So every day I go to work, every person I deal with, my clients, my team, I'm always like he's in my head, you know, um, in terms of what it is that we could do better and the things that we're trying to, I'm trying to build now in any little way, whether it's in my music and, and art space or whether it's in my legal field. Yeah, so I think... The, the sounding board that he was for me was, um, it's unlike any other that I have currently. At that time, at 30, you know, I think I had my midlife crisis at 30. 30 is when I quit my job and I decided to follow um, in, in sort of like my intellectual property entertainment law space. Um, I'd been working for about six, seven years by then. I was like, I'm done. This, is, this doesn't feel like what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. So I quit my job, I had no plan. I didn't have another job waiting. I, I like gave up on my pension. My parents were just like, <laughs> what are you doing? When everybody's out here tarmacking. I think I would have allowed myself to, I would tell myself that if you want to be a mom, just, just go ahead and do it. And that time passes really quickly. Yeah, so I think I would have told myself it would have been possible to go to school, to work, and to be a mom at the same time. But I was like, let me go finish my master's, come back, set up my business, do this, do this. And in, in that entire process, this, this part of my life was like, I'll get to it later. It didn't seem that I was aware at that age that it could happen simultaneously. So I think that's what I would tell my 30-year-old self now. Uh, 12. How do I like to enjoy my single turn? With a little bit of water, just a splash of water. I think you shouldn't mess with whiskey. I think it sat in a barrel for many years and um, it came out when it was ready, so just a splash of water. <laughs> I close it with another song, okay. Your touch is like a gentle breeze. Your smile is like the sun. Warms up my soul when the day is done. Baby, you are my one and only love. 
A. Yeah, everything I need, you are my heartbeat. Through and through I know everything is fine. Ooh, so sweet and divine. Oh, everything is, is fine. Whenever I'm with you. Say, a baby, let me count the ways you tend to make my day. One, two, you care for me, it's true. Three, four, you keep me coming back for more. Your kiss is sweet like honey, I'm addicted to your flavor. Like a natural high, you feel so good inside. That's why I know everything is fine. Oh, so sweet and divine. Oh, everything is, is fine. Mm, whenever I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.